maskless, Teddy, and the others began feeding around the periphery of the camp, apparently minding their own business and concentrating on eating grass. However, Taskless surreptitiously turned the tip of her trunk towards the kitchen and the tents to smell what and who was there. Wafting from the place where the food was kept was the delicious odor of very ripe bananas. Taskless loved bananas. She had first tasted them at the lodge feeding place, where a man came twice a day with a wheelbarrow full of vegetable and fruit scraps. These were usually peels and old outer leaves of lettuce and cabbages. But one day, there was a whole stalk of overripe, almost fermented bananas. Taskless liked the smell immediately, plucked one off the stalk, popped it in her mouth and savoured the sweet taste. She managed to eat most of them, sharing as few as possible with the others. From that day on, she particularly sought out bananas. On this evening, the smell was irresistible. She moved closer to the kitchen, a flimsy structure made out of a few wooden posts, sisal poles, chicken wire, and roofing felt. She could smell other good things as well. Pineapples, oranges, and various vegetables. She also noticed that it was unusually quiet in the camp tonight. There were no voices, and there was no strong, immediate smell of humans. She stopped feeding and rumbled gently. Tanya answered from among the palms with her unmistakable, long, rolling rumble, but stayed where she was. Teddy, Tony, and Tilly also answered, and they walked over to join Tuskless. These four animals, plus Tuskless's two-year-old calf, slowly approached the kitchen with their trunks held out in front of them. They got within a few feet and stopped and listened. Still, there were no sounds of people. Tuskless reached her trunk out and felt the outer wall of the kitchen. She wrapped her trunk around a sisal pole and pulled. There was a tearing noise as the pole was wrenched away. No one came out of the tent to chase them. The others moved forward and also started pulling on the poles and the wire. Tuskless quickly made a sizable hole in one wall of the kitchen. She reached her trunk in and tried to feel for the bananas. But they were on the opposite side of the kitchen and a table and a cupboard were in her way. She became impatient and leaned her head against the wall and pushed. The building swayed before collapsing sideways. The bananas were under the tilted over wall and roof. But Tuskless was undeterred. She went around to the other side, which was more or less intact, and started forcing her way through that wall. Once she got her head inside, she began to pull things out, push things over, open things up, and gather in as much food as she could. The bananas went first, of course, closely followed by the pineapples, oranges, mangoes, and papayas. These fruits, even large pineapples, could be placed whole in the mouth and crushed in the huge grinding molars with a great gush of juice. It was near ecstasy. The vegetables, carrots, potatoes, tomatoes, onions, lettuces, cabbages, cauliflowers, cucumbers, avocados, string beans, zucchini, eggplants went soon after. Most of the fruits and vegetables were stored in tin trunks, but this posed no problem for an elephant. The tin trunk was lifted up and turned upside down and stepped on a bit and kicked about if necessary until it disgorged its contents. Once the fresh produce was finished, 
Tuskless began to search around for other delicacies. She could smell bread and cookies and crackers in one wooden cupboard. This was knocked down and smashed open. The bread was quickly snatched up, and then the cookies and crackers were eaten, box or plastic bag and all. Next, a small camping fridge and a cooler were crushed, but neither contained anything interesting. Another cupboard with glasses and plates in it was tipped sideways and broken glass joined the other wreckage on the dirt floor of the kitchen. The bigger fridge was pulled and dragged from its place until it toppled over, disconnected from its gas cylinder. Noxious propane gas hissed out of the dangling tube with a sound and smell that would certainly have sent lesser elephants away. Just as Tuskless and Teddy were tackling the third cupboard with the jams and spices in it, they heard the engine of a car coming in their direction. A few minutes later, the headlights swept around the clump of palm trees at the clearing entrance and shone brightly on the five elephants standing in, on, and around the totally destroyed kitchen. The car hesitated for only a moment, and then the engine roared, and the car headed for them. Each elephant grabbed a last trunkful and started backing or turning away, reluctantly abandoning the banquet. Tuskless held her ground a little longer than the others, but the vehicle came straight for her, making loud engine noises, and she too left, carrying a box of spaghetti in her trunk while chewing on a paper bag full of half a pound of garlic. I can still close my eyes and vividly see that disastrous scene as I drove around the corner into the camp and our lights shone on what had been the kitchen. It was 4th November, 1978. As soon as the elephants left, I quickly got out of the Land Rover and crawled into the kitchen because I could hear and smell gas escaping. I found the gas cylinder and removed the regulator to close off the valve. I thought later how horrible it would have been if a spark had set off the gas while the elephants were there. The rickety, dry kitchen would have gone up in flames in seconds. As angry as I was at Tuskless and her gang, I did not want them to get killed or wounded. And in any case... I mostly blamed myself for what had happened that night. An unusual set of circumstances had led Tuskless to our kitchen. Masaku, my cook and camp worker, had left on five days' leave on 3rd November. On the day he left, my campmate Phyllis had come back from a trip to Nairobi with a huge load of groceries, meat and fresh fruits and vegetables including some overripe bananas with which she was going to make banana bread. The next day, filmmakers Warren and Jenny Gast had arrived at the camp for a project with yet another huge load of food. Since it was their first night there and Masaku was away, we had gone to have dinner at one of the lodges. Previously, we had left the camp unattended on many occasions. Elephants had broken into the kitchen two years before, when no one had been in the camp. It may or may not have been tuskless. There were also a few males around who raided camps then. After that, we carefully put food away and closed all the trunks to reduce the tempting odors, and we had not been raided again. On this evening, we put away as much food as we could. But there was so much that we could barely close the trunks. We even locked some food in the Toyota, so that it would not be left exposed in the kitchen. In the early evening, we had seen Tuskless heading in our general direction. We should have known better. By the latter half of 1978... 
Tuskless had become very, very bad about raiding camps. She and her group sometimes raided as many as three or four camps a day, both at night and in the daytime. She checked out our camp almost daily, but when she got too interested in the kitchen, she was chased away by Masaku. He usually just had to come out of his tent, and she and the others would move off, nonchalantly feeding as if they had never even known there was a kitchen in the camp. We thought we had arrived at some sort of understanding with Tuskless, but obviously had not. She was just waiting for her chance. And what a reward she got. She and the others ate all of our fresh food, except for what was in the Toyota and most of our staples. What they did not eat, they mostly ruined. It was a horrific mess. We started cleaning things up, working till after midnight. We ended up putting the refrigerator and one cupboard with the remaining food in a closed vehicle in case the elephants decided to come back.